Holotalk and Profiles in Holography is brought to you through the generous support of the International Holography Fund. For more information, visit their website at holographyfund.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Holotalk. We're talking to Ken Dunkley, who is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ken, how are you? Oh, great. Great, Frank. It's good to finally have you on the show. Yes, same, actually. I know we uh, did a uh, trip together over the summer, and many of the things that we'll talk about we probably discussed already on the trip. So it'll probably be review for you, but there's a lot of listeners out there that will be uh, listening to this, and it'll be new to them. Okay, all right. Why don't we start off with having you uh, tell the listeners about how you got involved with holography. I know one of your most famous holograms, and I know it's not your only hologram, but certainly the hologram that you will always be remembered for, Thoughts, was made while I was still in high school. But how did you get involved with holography leading up to making Thoughts? Uh, let's see. Leading up to Thoughts, I was, um, you know, I saw myself as a photographer. Uh, I always carried a camera um, and did quite a bit of shooting, actually. Um, I think I had gotten to the point where um, I was, um, you know, considered myself a, 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 a sub-professional, mm-hmm. and um, actually knew professionals at that time who were, you know, shooting professionally at studios in Manhattan, and um, um, of course I was always studying physics and, uh, at that time. Were you originally from Philadelphia? I'm originally, no, actually I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York, okay. Um, went to school, uh, high school in Harron High School in Manhattan, um, and um, spent a lot of time in Manhattan as a, as a youngster after school. Um, and, uh, of course, um, eventually wound up at New York University um, studying aer- aeronautical engineering, and I was really into aeronautical engineering, um, uh, mainly because I had... Um, worked with model airplanes since I can since I can remember probably about seven eight years old. Um, I started building model airplanes and just continued to build them actually all through um, you know regular school and then high school. Um, I also you know built model airplanes. Um, I got into cameras uh, through my brother who was in, started with cameras. So I started with my older brother, so I started with cameras behind him. And um, and uh, so that worked out very well for me. It worked out very well. There there are a lot of side stories along the way, and I thought I'm leaving leaving them leaving them out uh, as to why I did photography because I had a terrible memory, and I I always looked at a camera as my external memory. I see. On my onboard main, you know, my onboard external memory, so to speak. And your background is in physics, is that correct? My background is physics because I you know I. Did three years of aeronautical engineering and love, uh, and then got into physics and, and, the, and the quantum theory really bugged the hell out of me. I, it really bugged me that the thought that um, uh, um, a so-called particle can go through uh, two apertures at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, the quantum hypothesis, so to speak, uh, really threw me. And um, a friend, of, uh, a friend, Harry Kamada and myself, we decided, hey. Let's get into some real stuff. So we left the aero department, went into the physics department. I see. And um, and never looked back. Actually, where was Thoughts made? Thoughts was made at New York University, um, nineteen seventy, the summer of seventy three. Was it a holography lab that was be- being used for uh, research or it, for art? It, it, uh, Henry Stroke was my advisor, Professor Stroke. Um, it was a, a, a spectroscopic laboratory. The, they had a huge spectrometer. You know, typically a spectrometer is a little box, maybe two feet by three feet. Well, this spectrometer was like 25 feet long, uh, 15, 20 feet wide. Um, and it sat, um, it was specially constructed um, with um, concrete columns going 30 feet into the ground, um, supporting granite tables that supported uh, these huge, spectroscopic mirrors, okay, and they'd bounce the, the beam, then they would take a, I, I forget what source they used, they used to use various sources, but they used very, they, they over the years, they uh, they did very detailed, hyperfine structure, 
um, to look at very small energy levels in certain materials. And um, they brought me in, and um, they said, Ken, um, we have the spec. If you go inside the spectroscopic room, inside, so it's like inside a spectrometer, and if you can set up a hologram on the first table, uh, well, actually it said it was, you should be able to set up a hologram on the first table because those tables are perfectly flat and steady. You're right. Hmm. Uh, we found out years later they weren't, but that's another, still another story. Is that where you did your experiments as far as uh, drift with uh, air currents? My drift experiments came out later, much later, actually, when I was with Princeton Applied Research. Okay. Um, that was in the, from seven, I was with Princeton Applied Research from 76 to 86, a 10 year stretch. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, I had the opportunity to travel across the Delaware Valley and monitor everybody's laboratory. <laughs> I, I got a um, seismic um, uh, accelerometer, a uh, seismic detector, and um, I sampled, literally, I went to, uh, I had customers, you know, I had all these customers, like Bell Laboratories, I had customers, I had customers at Princeton, um, at uh, Universe, uh, Princeton University, I had customers at the um, Princeton Applied Physics Labs, I, I had customers uh, all over the place, in Philadelphia, whatever. So I actually went around sampling the optical tables of uh, numerous customers and got some idea. And all of this came out of the fact that I was able to create thoughts without isolation. Thoughts was created without, with zero isolation. No kidding. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay. Presumably it was because when we did it, when I did it, well, all of my holograms up at the New York University, we were all under the assumption that that place was peculiar because number one it's the highest point in the Bronx it's the highest point in New York City excuse me okay in fact there's a, a, a statue that um, <clears throat> that says so as much that says they, because somehow the, the British troops that came down from somewhere actually um, <clears throat> came through University Heights where my lab was so <clears throat> they built the, this laboratory at the highest point in New York City and that we thought was hollowed ground in terms of stability that was bull. Um, <laughs> we found out um, in more than one occasion that, that that place was no more stable than any other place. And the fact that I was able to make that hologram uh, with no isolation worried the hell out of me because I couldn't figure it because I always thought that, well, I thought I assumed that it was because this place was special. But then, of course, I measured it, and it wasn't. Isn't that something? It, it, yeah, it wasn't. Now, that's, let me let people know, because I'll have a photo of it on the uh, Holotalk webpage. Okay, great. great. Um, but it's a laser transmission hologram. Now, one of the things that I did not realize about this piece, I saw this piece for the first time, I believe, in 1979, I think it was, at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, right. That's when we showed it there. Yeah. yeah. And then I saw it again. It was in Montreal. I believe yeah, it. Images in Montreal, time and yeah. space. I didn't see it in Montreal. In other words, most of the places it went, I couldn't follow. Yeah. Um, so it traveled around the world, but I didn't. And that's when it was damaged at some point. Well, the one thing that I didn't realize is that it's actually a hologram that's recorded in that hologram. Right, right. Yes. I thought there were mirrors in the sand. Well, some people thought that at first, but if you look at it carefully, you realize, no, that can't be a mirror because, because it can't. It's not, re it's not reflecting what's it's not in reflecting the sand, which reflecting. as soon as you told me that on the trip that we took, I looked at it again and I realized, I said, well, why didn't I get this the first time? Well, you know, actually the, the photo does not show, when you see it in real life, you can delineate much more information inside of it, mm -hmm. and you can see the outline of what looks, to, what appears to be a mirror. But if you look closely, you, you, you realize that, well, it can't be a mirror. So it gets into, I did share with, um, um, I didn't, at first it was a secret. I didn't tell anyone how I did that. Oh, okay. Then, oh, yeah, it was a secret for years. And then I told, I think, one or two people, and then it just blew their minds. But then I think it was I'm, either Dan Schweitz or Sam Moray came at me years later and said, Ken, you know, that hologram of a hologram thing is a lot of, um, there's something, that still doesn't explain how you did that, huh, Is that a single beam or a split beam? 
Uh, it's not a single beam. No, it's, it's not a single beam. Okay. In other words, and that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess now after thirty something years, I should tell, <laughs> tell people how I did it. Oh no, 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 no. Maybe you shouldn't. Well, go ahead. Tell uh, people well, how no, you did well, it. Well, no, actually, it turns out that assuming you know about holography, if you look at it, you still really can't figure it out. If you look at it, um, you know what it's like? It's like, I'll be honest with you, it's like an optical Chinese puzzle. Notice Chinese puzzles that are like a wood, and you have to move one piece, and then the whole thing comes apart? Yes. Okay, well, I use the beam. There's one beam there that's used for two purposes. Both the reference and illuminating the other hologram? It's essentially that. It's used for two purposes. And it's used, it's used in such a way, the geometry is peaked in such a way that you, it's really, you can't tell. And it, at some point, you, if you know about holography and you figure it's got to be this, it's got to be that, it's got to be, you cannot figure out it could, because another thing has to do with the movement of time through the piece. Mm. If the time is going in one direction, and the plates have to be assembled in the opposite direction. The whole thing is an optical puzzle going either which way. And a lot of, most people don't even realize that. And I've never really talked on it. Um, when you, so it's almost like when you get to the point where you think you understand it, like uh, I think it was uh, Sam who came at me and said, that hologram of a hologram stuff doesn't fly. Um, there's something else going on in there. Um, and, and and he was the one that sort of sort of you know said, yeah it's it's really tricky that you know because there there time is flowing in two different directions in the piece within the piece and they're at odds with each other how you have to build it and how the way the motion of the flow of the image are too, are too, you look at it wait a minute and so you're really stuck you know yes. sir, sir it confuses me sometimes I'm like <laughs> <laughs> well. It amazed let me put it this way. It actually amazes me oh. when I when I when I got to that point when I when I put it down momentarily because it was never ever finished. People don't realize that the idea wasn't to do. The idea was to have a series of twenty plates in a spiral. Oh, I see. In a visual spiral, and what happened was I, I ran into a bump in the road. Um, I was supposed to do, knock this thing out, boom, 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 because I had prepared years for this. I had prepared for years setting up everything that I needed to do a series of pieces. And the first portion of it went so great, so fast, and the, the holograms were great A, super duper, brilliant quality. But actually, Thoughts itself is not a great A hologram, it's great B. Why do you say that? Well, because it is. Because it's at the thing that I was doing all along worked beautiful. And what happened was, all of a sudden, I could not get a steady exposure on what I had been doing right along, okay? And I actually worked two months on one plate to get the right exposure. It would not, and then my advisor walked through the door, Henry walked through the door and said, what have you done? To well, he always goes to France, actually, on a sabbatical. And he walked through the door thinking I had finished, or uh, I had come close to, Finishing this thesis, which I had expanded well beyond, um, I should, you know, beyond the point. I was doing all of this image smoothing. I created this um, uh, this rotating um, sequential process that presented images, three images to the eye at a very high rate to smooth it. Um, I had done all these great things, and Henry thought I put a wrap on this thing. And I walked in. And I said, Henry, I, 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 I got good news and bad news. You know, the good news was, the bad news was I didn't finish it. I didn't even touch it. The good news was I had this piece. Well, Henry looked at this piece for like five seconds and said, well, what else are you doing here? He, I mean, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't register within his consciousness. And I knew I was in trouble. Um, not serious trouble, but yeah. But uh, it was just... Um, um, it, it, it was um, it was uh, it wasn't good because I didn't you know I was supposed to knock out that hologram within weeks. I spent the entire summer on it, two months on the last plate alone. Um, did not get my grade A plate because I was a stickler with that. You know, super bright. Um, I still have the pl plates preceding it. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, I have all of the plates preceding it, 
and I got stuck on this fourth plate. How many final copies do you have? Well, I only have one. One. I only had one, because I could never, even with thoughts itself, like I said, I had to settle for a grade B, what I consider a grade B, which looks great, if you know, it looks great until you realize I whip out the other one, and then you say, wow, the previous plates are so much better. So, you know, better in what way, as far as their brightness or diffraction efficiency? Or? Well, they're bright. They're, they're actually, they are actually some of the best plates. Well, the best plates I've ever seen. Um, I got to the point where I could make super, super great plates, even from edge to edge. I would, uh, I would expand the beam to the point where I would keep all of the, the proper ratios within the beam. Yes, just yeah. right. Yeah, if you have and, the power to do that, that's good. Well, to do. I had a 50 milliwatt yeah. at that time. That was that was that was the end all and be all. So I had 50 milliwatts that I could expand and throw away a lot of light to make it really smooth and even. And uh, that's why the image has a sort of a smooth, a smoothness to it. That no, so I really, I really bust my chops on that one actually, and uh, and I never understood. And that's what started me on that work later on. That I took eight years sampling. I wanted to know what the hell happened in that laboratory that I couldn't do that last plate, and that got me into you know the vibration. And um, so you know, I spent eight years essentially doing. Um, Interferometric stability tests and a vibration tests simultaneously at all these different places, and you know, and did that paper. And finally, wrote that paper. Actually, I wrote the paper. It was bounced by Applied Physics. Oh, they bounced it. Hmm. I wrote it. Believe it or not, I wrote it twenty years before I finally submitted it. You would you believe that? Yeah. And where, where <laughs> was it, it finally in, published? I wrote it in eighty. I wrote it in the 80s. Where could listeners find it? Well, I finally, um, I wrote it in the 80s. I sent it to, uh, I think it was Applied Physics so-and-so, Real Optics, you know, Optics really. And they looked at it and they said, well, one, two things. One, we don't believe you. And two, um, we don't understand you. <laughs> um, well, so could you write an additional uh, tutorial to the to the paper which would explain the vibration part of it? Since since uh, you sent it to an optics journal and you mm -hmm. did vibration, um, yeah. you know that they didn't feel that that was kosher. Um, and then um, and I said to hell with that. And I just I just left the paper. The paper was perfect. It was a perfect paper in my mind. It didn't really need to be touched. And um, so I just went on. And so many years later, many years later, because the results were astounding. The results said that that the ground, that most holographers work in um, a worsened environment than the floor that they're operating on. They build the inner tube tables. I sample inner tube tables. I created a, a model of an inner tube table that seemed to, um, I was able to verify verify it uh, theoretically. And it's, it simply said that once you set up an inner tube table, your results are actually worse than the floor. And you can easily test it. You can test it within 20 minutes. Don't see the whole thing. So all of these years, holographers have been building these tables, and they're making the situation worse. If they just get on the floor, the concrete floor, where they, that they're putting the tables on top of, yes. they would get much better results. But no know, kidding. Life is really strange in that way. That is very strange. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I shared it with uh, Steve Benton one day, and that blew his. He said, "Ken, you got to publish this paper." You got to pub. So he urged me to publish the paper, and the paper was published. And, um, um, and so, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I got. You know, I'm glad the paper was published with someone who could understand it. I guess I sent it to the wrong group of scientists. And um, yeah. So. So the whole drift of what you were trying to convey, if you'll pardon the pun, was mm -hmm. the fact that air currents are more damaging to your holographic setup right. than vibration. Right. Air currents were it. Were the culprit. Air currents something that I wasn't focused on when I did Thoughts. Gee, Thoughts was made in a room with no with no table cover. <laughs> oh, God, what? Who knew about table covers? And, um, you know, we knew to keep quiet. We knew to don't move. We knew to, you know, let things settle. We knew to do all these things. But um, it turns out that those people who worked on the table covers were a lot smarter than, uh, were a lot smarter, period. And um, those and those people who could afford a, a commercial 
commercial table. I found that commercial tables work fabulously. They were fabulous. Oh, they are we okay, but it's, it's your it's your typical hobbyist uh, table on the inner tubes that uh, yeah, makes the, the inner problem. Yeah, the tubes were killing us, but we didn't realize it. We were, you know, we, you know, you know, we did. We were actually worsening the situation, and um, and still coming out with holograms. Thank God. So, what if the inner tubes were removed? If, are the inner tubes the only culprit? I mean, it's it's difficult well, for people to get down the on the floor. Down, you get better stability. But <laughs> Take the inner tubes oh, out, and you'll have better stability. Better, but see, the, 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 string, the strange thing about this, all you had to do was set up a small Michelson interferometer, which would take like 20 minutes, excuse me? Hmm. All right, an hour. Let's push it to an hour. And then take the, put the beams through tubes, cardboard tubes, almost like toilet paper tubes, except longer, like mailing tubes, yes. cardboard, simple. Just put a... Put the, and that, and once you did that with the tubes on and with them off, then you realize what your problem was. What if you have a long throw after the beam is diverged, say through the spatial filter or something? What, how do you cover that? Um, it turns out after the mirror, after you know, reaches the combining mirror, and um, oh, ask your question again. I'm sorry. Ask, you know, ask. the beam travels around a table. So let's say we're sending them through the long tubes. No, well, I'm just said, yeah. I'm just talking about the test. In other words, okay. let's, let's say we, oh, we just, the test. We just okay. set up a, a pure Michelson. We're not expanding the beams. We just, you could, but you just basically have bare beams. Okay. Okay, you, you have your Michelson with bare beams, whatever. And what I'm suggesting is that they put the beams through a tube on the, when you, you know, the, the, the arm lengths. Just put them through cardboard tubes. Yes. When it after it reaches the combining mirror, it really doesn't matter. So there's nothing after that. Then, then it just goes to your detector, a little um, slit with a detector behind it to monitor, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, you're, you're monitoring the pad. You have to monitor it. You can't, it, it, unfortunately, if you tr if you um, do what most of us did for years, which is to just to look at the movement by eye and just look at it for long enough and say, oh, okay. We're good. You know, most of us did it that way. Uh, but uh, you find out that once you have a sampling, um, you know, some uh, sampling device behind it where you can sample it and digitally um, see your results over a period of time, then you can really get a handle on it, what's really, what's really affecting your, your system. And once you do that, the picture becomes terribly clear that it's air currents. And by simply moving or removing that tube out of the way, you see the results get better by factor 29. A factor 29. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow. The results improve the factor 29. Um, so. So would you recommend people send their beams through tubes? Or? No, I, I use no. that to test your... To Just test to test. Your, in other words, if you need to test your stability, you set up one on the floor, you set up one on the table. Mm -hmm. And you monitor the results of both of them. Okay. You know, usually, since we only have one laser, in the, you take once you take the system, the Michelson, you set it on the floor in the area of this table, right next to the table. Actually, this is what I did on just about virtually every table that I looked at. I set up two systems. I I was able to set up a um, uh, a, a Michelson system, and then uh, and monitor that. And then I had an accelerometer, the seismic accelerometer, and a a, a fast Fourier transform analyzer, an FFT they call it, um, that you know allowed me to monitor vibration, so I could see what the correlation between vibration and um, the uh, Michelson stability, um, and um, it was uh, it was clear after you sample you know multiple systems what the, what the pattern was, and it it, it was clear after a while that. Um, and it was astounding too, because I didn't expect. You know, we. You know, when you start something like this, you never know where, where you're going to go. You're thinking one thing, and um, the reality is something else. But my, but the point I'm trying to get to is that if you if you built a table, set up a reference Michelson on top of it, and on the adjoining floor. Okay, the one on the table should be much better. Right. Right. It should. Right. If the floor is better than the table, you realize something went wrong. And usually what would go wrong was that they would, once they put those in the tubes and pumped them up, it turns out they were amplifying the game. The game was being, uh, under, in other words, the, if you look at the, if you look at 
the um, you would you if you look at the you know the frequency response curve, you'd see that you were actually amplifying the rubber the rubber inner tube would actually make it worse. Period. It would just make it worse. My table, other tables. Um, so, you know, it was clear. But again, the good news is, um, even under the worsen, even after you have a table that's where you pumped it up, because I did have tables here in Philadelphia, and I set up tables. I had it under here. I set up what I call the ideal uh, table. You know, a lot of sand boxed in. What is uh, the ideal table? Well, it wasn't. No, it wasn't wrong. I was wrong, of course. I didn't have oh, okay. what I built it. I didn't have this model. Well, what, what is the wrong ideal table? <laughs> well, That's I good to know, job, too. After, you know, working with um, the guys in New York, I, when I came out to Philly, I said, well, look, let me um, let me build. Was a, well, we took a, basically what we always did was to take a, uh, a solid plywood box, really uh, with, um, actually, I think I used, um, a one-inch ply would doubled up in some areas, so it was really strong, really tough box. And we packed it with sand. What we did, we packed it with sand and got to the point where we hammered and, like, had a hole and hammered the sand, hammered the pressure. You know, you applied spikes into the sand to make sure you you were, you took out any resonant. You didn't want to have any sand settle, so you have resonances within the wood. You know, we went through all of this trouble, and then we'd lay a steel uh, one-eighth, sheet of um, one inch in thick steel plate on top of that so you can get a magnetic hold down you know so you know we did then you try to make it level as best you could yeah um through all of that and then of course you put uh, four inner tubes under it sometimes five like one four in the corners and one in the center um sometimes you know the um i forget what i did just four in the corners of four or five whatever and um, you know you put the inner tubes in there, and then you then you pumped it up. It's very very low. Just just you know raise it a, um, two inches off the ground or whatever. Just uh, just very shallow uh, pump up, and um, and that was it. And you were happy. You know you then you started making your holograms, thinking you had the best system in the world. Not um, <laughs> so. Um, so now, it, what would it, you have done to that system to make it better? To just take the inner tubes out? Actually, the way things go, it would have best just take the inner tubes out, and then you're, you're right away you will improve your stability. Well, Ken, well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to take. I've had a table here since 1983. Uh -huh. I'm going to take the inner tubes out. Uh -huh. That's okay. going to be my project over the holiday season. Try, well, try it. Not only, but make sure. Like, now remember the main thing, though. It's a one-time deal because oh, once yeah. I get these inner tubes out, I'm not going to be able to get them back in. Oh well, just lower mm -hmm. the air out of them. Till the, till the whole system is settled down to on the on, on the top on top yeah because I always had slats under there when I built my system I built slats so that I could actually pump it down to, take it down to nothing and still have the tubes sit there so you could just pump them back up mm -hmm. um, but um, well, what I'm really saying is that um, it, it was the air currents that allowed that was really disturbing our system okay more than anything else it was air currents. And, uh, Even more and so, cutting the air currents. Yeah, it's not vibration. In yeah. other words, vibration, even though vibration is bad, that's not what gets you. So you're saying by cutting the air currents, you're making more of an improvement than taking the oh, inner tubes yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Well, Absolutely. maybe I'll leave the inner tubes Absolutely. in then. Absolutely. I'll leave the inner tubes in. Because I do all my baffling throughout the table. I do baffles, baffle work throughout the entire setup. Some people setup. cover their entire table. Some people do. I don't. I don't have. Right. A I never see. Yeah. That was it. And then, of course, there were issues with covering your entire table because there, there, there were always a. Well, there was always one phenomenon I never got quite a handle on. I got. I got to admit this. I, you know, certain things you 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 look at and and the certain questions come. There was. I found it was something that was real strange, and I and I, I needed another. I needed need another series of experiments to ever resolve it, and and it was this. Okay, um, there were different ways of baffling the system. If you want to try to reduce the air currents, and but most of them, you know, uh, um, let me just say it. I found out that uh, if you put tubes around a, a bare beam, a Michelson beam, you know, reduced everything. But if you took a TP approach, a TP meaning you took two pieces of cardboard, let's say um, 11 by 
bean or whatever sheets and somehow put them in a TP over the beam. Okay. It made it worse. No kidding. And I never understood that. I said, well, something must be, something with, something that's, it picked up maybe some oscillate. I, I, I thought, I scratched my head. If you put them through a teepee, just take the square the rectangular pieces, just lay them together in a teepee so that the beam goes like through the center there. And it happened the first time. I did more experiments. It happened another time. And I did it three times. And I saw it am getting worse. And that, that I didn't, uh, that I couldn't grasp how it could get worse than having no protection whatsoever. How could that be? And, and I, after the third time, I realized, you know, um, you don't have time to track this one down, don't we? So um, just, just put it in the back of my mind, and I just sort of left it there. And it's still there. I never, I never, there's certain things that you, as you, you know, research, you stumble over other questions that come up. And that was one other question that I was never able to resolve. What did work well? Um, well, anything but a TP, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I, never, I never understood that. I um, use I use vertical baffles throughout the table, and they're just randomly placed so that any type of air current would be just sort of like diffused. Uh, well, that sounds like I would actually try that. I would try that. Um, it's like a maze, like a house of mirrors, except with baffles. Right. Um, I found that, uh, again, I found that the ideal baffle was a two, and anything else was not as good. Yeah, but let, here's where I get back to the original question that I asked you. Uh -huh. if, if we did the setup and we were sending our laser beams through tubes, okay, mm -hmm. eventually each one of those beams, both the reference beam and the object beam, is going to have to be diverged or spread out. Well, to make a hologram. Yes, yeah, so what can we do in that area of the table, because we can't send that through a tube, because it's now the size of an 8 by 10 Oh, yeah, plate. well, in that case, well, the case that you were doing what everybody else was doing, they, they, we would be baffling the Baffling, beam. okay. We would typically just baffle the beam and 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 um, assume our system was steady enough, and, and we would always come out with a hologram. But it, the issue was um, stability. If you shot it again... If it's different than the first, then you I shot see. it again. Then it was. Then you notice that some were brighter than others. Then, then you, then, then you realize you had something going on in your system that you needed to to work on. But um, those people who were sensitive enough to put in, a, who who were purchased. I say purchased. Notice I said purchased. Um, not only did they get a a, 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 a real optical table, you know. Um, such as like an NRC or something like that. Um, then they bought a cover for it, spending Google's more money. Um, if you could put a cover around your entire type, of course I would test that cover to make sure it didn't amplify for whatever reason. Again, I'm not sure why that a system would amplify, but it did. Yeah. Um, well, I have three feet that goes around my table, so my the room that my table is in is really only has three feet of space around it. And it's a four by eight table, uh -huh. so in a sense, it is enclosed already. Right in the room yeah. itself. Yes. Right. And in fact, that's almost the way I looked at mine. Like what I used was, believe it or not, um, my table was on a wooden table. My optical table was simply a wooden table. Okay. Uh, you got that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wait a minute. What do you mean? It was a wooden table. It was a. It was a. Um, Thoughts was built on a wooden table. It had four inch legs four-inch square legs, so they were thick. Um, and that and was a split beam setup done on that wooden table. Yeah, it was more than that. It was split and then split again. Isn't so that I, amazing? I had six beams to do thoughts. See? There you go. Uh, you also you also did some other work more recently at the uh, Holo Center in New York. Yeah, the right? whole, yeah, but, um, yeah, Dan had, um, you know, or Dan, before he left, crossed over he uh, he brought me he brought me back to life actually he um said ken you know uh, you know you know we're here and you know if, if you ever have some ideas you want to crunch um which i did actually i didn't think i'd ever get a chance to to do them and um you know he invited me to submit a proposal i did and uh 2000 year 2000 we shot uh, this piece that um you know, a real stunning uh, piece. And the piece, the piece, the, it's really a great piece because it's, it's interactive. 
Um, it, it represents the what I call a scattered element composite hologram. Um, um, what I call you know that's that's something I stumbled over in seventy four nineteen seventy four, um, um, and uh, this was one instance of a scattered element composite hologram where you have the elements of the hologram are widely scattered, but they relate to each other optically. Um, elements in one or uh, elements in another. And um, 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 I had 15, uh, roughly 15 people in one and 15 people in the other, and they relate. And the, uh, the, the observer is able to be a part of it. Oh, they stand on opposite sides of one another. Yeah, I think correct? I shared with you that there are two plates, and you each observer looks through plates dead into each other's eyes. But and also you see the and you know the um, the people around. And of course, Dan is in one of those images. It's um, let me put it this way: I showed the piece um, in Atlanta at the at a large um, photographic exhibition. They invited me, and it took three days to set up. Uh, mainly because I had to build a room. It took two days to build a room inside of this huge hallway, City Hall, City Hall East in uh, Atlanta. Um, the piece, um, the piece went up, and uh, it was the hit of the show. I'm told. So a photographic show. So it was, um, it was you know, it's very, uh, it's a very stimulating piece, and it's very, uh, it's interactive. It's what is the size of the piece that you shot? Um, well, the, the basic plates, roughly um, yeah, thirty by forty centimeter, maybe or something. Oh like no, that? they're much smaller. They're, um, oh, okay. they're what is it? Eight uh, by ten? No, I, I'm trying. To, they're some odd size because they trimmed it to. They're thirteen by. Oh, okay, yeah, they were using. They're eleven, they're 11 by sixteen, eleven by okay. thirteen, something like yeah. that. There's some odd size because I had to trim it. Uh, there's some odd size. Um, they're you know two plates. Um, they're separated twenty inches apart, and when you look through either one of them with somebody else on the other side, you know, you're very close to an individual. And but um you're not sure what the other person is seeing and they're not sure what you're seeing. Yeah. But um the whole thing is really a trip on on on, on for for both persons and um, so it's um You've really covered both sides with holography, both the uh scientific and artistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well back then I think well back then everybody felt I think in one way or another, uh, you know, you were at the start of a new medium, and you're really trying your best to define it. You know, everybody gave it their shot, whatever medium they were in at that time. I was saw myself as laser, because um, I loved the 3D. I mean, to to filter it out, you know, to me was like throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once we, um, you know, um, depending on how much you filtered out, you know, the effect to get white light or what have you, you know, which was um, necessary. Uh, it was really hard to get a balance, but uh, um, I like the balance that Rudy struck. Who was it? What was Rudy's last name? Burkow. Yeah, Rudy Burkow. Rudy, hi, Rudy, if you're there. Yeah, Rudy really, I, I, he struck a, to me, he struck a really perfect, uh, a really nice balance between the, the you know, the, um, the color, uh, the need for white light images. And, uh, the and motion, set. motion in some, uh, many of his holograms as you would pass the piece. Well, I, I haven't seen some of his la later ones. I well, <laughs> I've seen all the early ones. Yeah, well, there was motion in some of the early ones, too. Oh, uh, well, I, I didn't particularly focus on that. Um, Optic, mo you know, optical effect, not stereogram effect. Oh, okay. Optical okay. effect the, that he was the, doing. Optical movement, some type of aberration. Like yes, exactly. That. Yeah, um... Yeah, well, his all worked. He, he got. He always got his to work really nicely. I mean, I always liked his, the idea, wise way he executed them. And um, I was in high school when you guys were doing all this. Really? Stuff. Yeah. Wow. I was the young person. You know, and and they thought I was an old man. You know, like <laughs> I was the uh, since I was older than some of the guys, and um, I didn't think anything of it until one day somebody came up to me and said, "Ken, you have two kids. You have a job." How do you do this? <laughs> and I said, well, um, uh, uh, I work around the clock. Right? <laughs> exactly. I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, well, I couldn't answer them. And I realized they were right. Everybody else was like free and wheeling and young, and, you know, 
And I said, you're the only one who's married. And you got two kids. Yeah. And it was some, somewhere along that, that way, I said to myself, Dunkley, you can't do this anymore. You know, you, you have other responsibilities. And uh, at some point I realized I needed to, I needed to get a job. I needed yeah. to get a real job that I could support my kids uh, the way they needed to. And uh, so I ultimately sort of got into, no, I got a job. A decent job, but then Good I couldn't you. stop the holography. <laughs> so I kept on. <laughs> well, I so saw I did. I did the research. I didn't make you know. I didn't make uh, holograms per se, but I did the other research. I did. I did what I could do. Um, you know, to to like um, because I still had that fire burning. You know, burning burning inside of me. Yeah, there are a lot of sacrifices that have to be made if you're going to work yeah, in this it's, field. It's, that's for yeah, sure. Because I, at that time. Uh, you know, I always thought that artists were over, overly selfish and self-centered, and I didn't really want to become that. Mm. Although, I, as I looked around, I realized I was. Uh, so, <laughs> I was, I was like, like, damn, we always, I always talked to him. I said, damn, don't you ever want to get kids? Don't you ever want to marry and get kids? He looked at me like, yeah. what are you talking about? Kids, once you have kids, you can't get anything done. Oh, that's not true. I had three kids. Well, did you get it? <laughs> Alex, no, it's it's like the. Um, hey, like I said, you've either you've, you're you're either cut out for it or you're not. You know, right, I mean, right. Well, there's well, there's no uh, other life. If if you really wanted to concentrate on doing this, there, you know, I I know people don't realize it, but there was nothing else. I mean, you you had to make money, you had to support a family, and you had to also be working in holography. You had to. You, and you, had, you, you had gave to. up everything else that everyone else enjoyed. Yeah. But, but at some point, I, I made a conscious decision. I said, Dunkley, come on, come on, come on. Come on, snap out of it, snap out of it. Um, so I didn't totally snap out of it, but I, I don't, the, the feel that burning feeling that, you know, when you'd wake up, you'd, you have to make it do a piece or whatever. Yeah. That's gone, thank well, God. Well, look at us. It's 8 o'clock at night. Huh? It's 8 o'clock at night, and here we are doing a show. Well, it's not like we just woke up at 7 o'clock at night. Is, We've been up since that's, 5, 6 o'clock this morning. You, you don't understand. That's why I really, when I realized, uh, I, been, I sort of followed the work you had been doing over the years. I said, this guy's really good. He's, he's, he's you know, he started, you were there. And you you put in a tremendous amount of work. You maintained the site. You did the hologram. You did the tiny hologram, the shoebox hologram. You know, I, I was I was like lurking. What is that phrase when you say you you're just watching somebody from the side from a lurking, distance lurking. lurking? And I said no, I got really impressed by the fact that you, for the state of Pennsylvania, and probably a lot, hell of a lot more, you really carried the mantle, as far as I was concerned. Well, thank you very much. You know, I mean, um, and that's just not boohoo. That's that's real from where I'm sitting. Between you and me, you've been you've been saying stuff to me. Maybe you've been doing it very quietly, so you haven't realized that people have been hearing you. But I've been I've been hearing you. Okay. I've been hearing you. you, you I mean, you speak hologram. Huh. <laughs> you That's really nice. do. Well, you kid, how how old are your kids now? Uh, twenty eight, twenty seven, and twenty five. Well, your kids are not much older. My kids are um, your kids are almost about a little bit ten years older, than, younger than mine. Yeah. So mine was like 38. Wow. Um, hey. Pushing 40. Wow. Yeah, it's um, it goes fast. It goes fast. Yeah, and you know what? Well, I won't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> it went so fast that what's left is really scary, man. It's just going to be like, and that's it forever. Uh, well, you know? that's why I think sometimes when you, as a, as you get older, you get a little bit more crazy. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, is this all there is? Let me go crazy. I might as well yeah, go crazy. Yeah, this is it. Well. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover? Um, let's see. Okay. Um, um, oh, gee. Uh, well, the, the three DVG. Okay. It's not a hologram, but were you the person, somebody that we spoke with during that trip? put something on the internet that said that they had used my 3D glasses to look at my hologram image. Oh, no. And, and they saw it in 3D. Oh, good. Yeah. I thought I was the only one who did that. So, and it took I'll have a link. About, and I only did it about 15 years ago. I'll have a link on, uh, 
on the on the Hall of Talk webpage that people can go over and see all about your three DVG. Okay, okay, that that'll be good because I mean I forget who did that, but somebody again used the three DVG to look at the the hologram image and then see that in three D. Oh, okay. Yeah, you might try it yourself. Huh. You, might, you might be you might hit it off. Based on what I know, with this little with this three DVG thing. It, it is possible to make a picture appear, quote unquote, truly three dimensional. Okay. This isn't a stereo picture you're talking about. This is a flat picture. No, I'm saying yeah. when you take a flat picture, any ordinary flat, that's what the three D V does. It takes a flat, ordinary picture. Yes, I just wanted to point that out to people. Oh, okay, I got you. Oh, okay, folks, it takes a flat, regular, ordinary photograph, or picture, especially a picture from a mag. National Geographic works fabulous. If you ever have any National Geographic magazine or any magazine for that matter, and you you train yourself to use it, you it, yes, there's a little training step. Uh, typically, it takes uh, initially maybe ten, five, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes um, with the first. But you, but if you don't see it within the first five minutes, uh, you got a problem. Typically, either you see it or you don't see it. And if you see it, it will it will change you. It will change you. Um, you will never be the same. Okay. All right. We'll <laughs> leave it at that. Um, so um, I'll send one of these things to you. Okay. And uh, I thought I had left one with one of the fellows we were with. You but, may have. I don't remember. Um, but I need to get one to them. Since I found three of them, I can, um, you know, get rid of two. All right. Well, if they're listening to the show, they can contact they, you. I owe you. Yeah. Right. Okay. And if they're not listening to the show, well. I owe you anyway. That's how life slips by sometimes. Great. Frank, it's been a pleasure. All right, Ken. I've got to come down to Philadelphia, and we got to go out and grab something to eat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Talk to well, you later. Okay. Right. Great. Bye. Thanks for calling. All right. All right. Bye-bye.